So uh, thanks everybody for joining us. This is uh, specifically to talk about staffing and capacity building, uh, facing our specific challenge of um, talent starvation. So just to get a sense while we're resolving some uh, technical, the standard technical issue, standard issue, te technical issue. How many people here are actually currently attempting to hire the majority of the room, in fact? Are there people here who are, this isn't a matchmaking question, looking for work? Okay. So there usually are a few people who show up also looking for work. Uh, our, our hope is to uh, make this presentation rather quick so that we can get into talking about specific use cases, but maybe we can start to get a little bit of a sense of, uh, you know, kind of the, the specific need. How many people are hiring for very small shops, let's say five people or smaller? few people. How many between, let's say, a break off of 30 down to 5? And how many for larger than 30? Anybody over, say, 200? Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, it, there, there, there have definitely been some conversations with some very, very large shops, and I think that that's a, a different challenge. Um, and we're very pleased to be talking about uh, the, the smaller shops, I think, in this time around. So, um, uh, so in any case, uh, do you, since uh, we're in a little bit different situation, do you mind just kind of hitting the slides forward? Sure. Cool. And I can also, actually, I'll sit down next to you and we can, we can make things easier like that. Um, is it all right? I, I assume it's all right. Everybody can see if, if we're sitting instead of standing. So in any case, I'm Kay Van Valkenburg. Uh, I'm the um, principal of Own Sourcing. Uh, which is a uh, training company in Boston, and uh, I've been uh, doing uh, Drupal since 2007, uh, and prior to that um, was doing uh, software development, mostly for the web and also for uh, uh, exhibit displays uh, uh, since 1998, and a trainer since 1990. And I'm Jesse Day, and I've been working with Kay at Own Sourcing, uh, and I've been involved in Drupal since 2010. I'm a developer and a trainer, and prior to that, I worked as a teaching assistant and tutor, and so the education and training aspect of what you can do with Drupal is uh, something that interests me a lot. Cool. And of course, there's a third personality who features prominently in our title, and that is Maslow. Uh, I'm sure everybody's very familiar with uh, this uh, psychologist, but just in case, because this concept is pretty key to what we're talking about, uh, Maslow is famous for his um, hierarchy of needs, and his notion was that uh, human beings are uh, uh, capable of accomplishing uh, great things and, great, and having great satisfaction, uh, but in order to experience uh, these things that he actually termed as uh, peak moments, you had to have a number of things in place that were basic requirements. And these ranged from very fundamental things, uh, breathing, water, you know, uh, through uh, some, uh, you know, still re relatively concrete things to things like family, sexual intimacy, all the way up to things that are quite hard to, uh, you know, uh, uh, truly get concrete about in our heads, you know, creativity, spontaneity, and things like, spontaneity and things like that. So interestingly, uh, the, uh, the notion of Drupal is often also described in terms of a peak, but more often that peak has kind of a treacherous side to it, uh, where people picture it with uh, piles of corpses accumulating at the bottom and things getting worse and worse for Drupal teams. I'm sure you're all familiar with the image that's gone around the internet of actually a bulldozer pushing corpses off the edge. It came up again in the Drupal ladder uh, sprint, uh, presentation just a, just a few moments ago. Um, I don't know that that image of Drupal continues to be uh, a particularly useful one for us to propagate in the community. I think that it was probably true uh, certainly leading up to 2007 from the war stories that I heard. Around 2007 when I started, uh, Drupal 5 came out and I got the sense that people felt that we were turning something of a corner 
And I would say by now, it feels very much like we've turned a corner. And I think that that corner is that now we have a framework that we can rely on. There was a bit of a debate a couple of years ago, you know, is Drupal a CMS, is Drupal a framework? And I think it's fair to say that it's both. And that framework basically means that we, as developers, can rely an awful lot on a structure provided by software, and importantly, a structure provided by the community that helps us avoid these harrowing experiences that people describe. And th I imagine there, there are some people in the room who perhaps feel that uh, this precipice is still very much a threat, still very much in place. For what it's worth, just to illustrate, how many people, or maybe this isn't even a fair question, imagine how many people would raise their hands if we said, how many people have actually stepped through the bootstrap process, for example. Very fundamental thing happens every time a page is loaded on, uh, on Drupal, at least ostensibly. Um, step through the bootstrap process even for the most simple page. I can't imagine just in the conversations that I've had in the community there being more than say maybe one or two. So maybe that those brave souls would like to raise their hands. We rely on that uh, and we don't need to worry about it. And in fact, unless uh, we've got some very dire uh, testing need, it doesn't happen on a project. We don't step through the bootstrap process. So I know that there are people who do it and that it's a useful thing to continue uh, working on. But if we start talking about this hierarchy of needs, where can we actually start drawing uh, a point at which people can feel successful? Back in 2007, uh, this uh, famous learning curve was put out. And uh, it's certainly worth noting, I think the bottom of the screen might actually be cut off, but <laughs> it's certainly worth noting that um, you did an awful lot of learning before you could work. In fact, only the very top two lines represent when people could theoretically be productive and work as a Drupal consultant or uh, in a Drupal shop, and then the next step up was IMCHX or, <laughs> you know, Unconed. So I think that that, we can all agree, has changed significantly. And the thing that we'd like to posit today, uh, from personal experience, from uh, having surveyed a number of shops in the Drupal community, and uh, having trained uh, uh, new users, we can now say that you can successfully hire people who haven't even completed the bottom item on this and expect them to be productive within weeks. That this isn't, uh, I can't quite scroll, I can't, is there, a, is there a scroll down so that we can get, so the bottom in any case is, uh, you know, that, that you can uh, install Drupal. Uh, and we can get into some very specific cases if that sounds a little too incredible for people. Uh, there have been some great um, successes with people coming up. All right, so what does it mean, you know, this thing that I, I feel, uh, I haven't heard a lot of confirmation uh, elsewhere necessarily yet, but I feel pretty strongly that, uh, that the fact that we have this framework provided by the community and provided by the software uh, really does constitute a, a major advantage over at least a few years ago. Uh, you know, now much of the functionality that we have access to and much of the, much of the functionality that goes into uh, a large range of, of sites is actually plug and play. In fact, there's an entire class, group, uh, professional niche uh, in Drupal that uh, works entirely on 100% uh, plug and play technology. They click together websites. That's been the dream in Drupal for a long time. And there is a thriving group of developers who do that. Is it, uh, did you, were you able to pull up um, the uh, Drupal Gardens uh, showcase? Uh, once, yes. Yeah, cool, so we'll switch over. Uh, uh, do we have the URL as well to share? Yeah, sampler.drupalgardens.com. You can see uh, some pretty impressive sites that have been clicked together. Now this is worth bearing in mind uh, because we think that this, uh, this approach of focusing on click together websites is a good starting point for uh, new members of the community. This isn't a new idea has been put around for, for quite a while. Uh, is it easy to go back to the... Cool. Right. So uh, that's the upside. You have all this fun functionality that's basically configuration. On the downside of this you know, f existence of a framework, this also means that you could look for people with uh, web development experience that spans a decade, and they're still going to need training. And that's just the raw truth of it. Uh, we, and I'm sure a number of other Drupal shops here, uh, have received quite a large uh, range of projects that have come from 
talented PHP developers, and they're no longer viable as Drupal products, as Drupal projects. Uh, you know, one example, not too long ago, we uh, received a project where a, a talented group of, of PHP uh, developers had created some quite elegant code for including menus, and it put them directly into Garland templates. You know, fortunately, uh, that was a relatively simple fix, right? We uh, started with a Zen uh, uh, base theme and, and uh, rethemed their site for them, and, and they were good to go. But while they had this situation, it of course meant that while with Drupal, anyone who has permissions can change menu items, in that particular case, only the developers could. And they uh, had a bit of a, a blocker also when they wanted to do certain types of upgrades. Uh, so, you know, this, this very experienced team had taken, uh, taken that project down uh, a somewhat unviable path and uh, was expecting gasps from the uh, awful um, scene that's depicted of people falling off the Matterhorn. But uh, uh, in fact, uh, the, the shocking thing here is anybody who's familiar with the dock route in, um, in Drupal.org, some people are smiling. Thank you. It's actually supposed to be kind of fun. Um, so people who are familiar with the dock route in Drupal will recognize immediately that um, there are a couple file names in here that are very unfamiliar and probably mean that uh, the team who worked on this site hacked core. Uh, if people aren't familiar with this term hacked core, it's a, it's a very bad thing that has horrible consequences, including the death of kittens. Um, so uh, uh, this was a, a quick clue when this was actually part of a training project. Uh, the, the team that inherited this uh, site found that they weren't successful in uh, doing upgrades, so they, they felt they needed to learn more about Drupal in order to do a number of security updates that needed to happen in fairly short order. And uh, every time they did it, uh, the site fell apart. And uh, so the uh, pre-training review of what they had to work with, of course, revealed that this wasn't a Drupal challenge. Uh, we could still train on the items that they wanted to train on, but the real challenge was actually going to be discovering how Core had been hacked and why, and, uh, and then uh, implementing uh, the, the um, features that they had through these um, non-standard uh, coding practices, you know, through instead standard coding practices. So. Whether or not you buy the idea that starting with click-through um, uh, site building is actually useful for your shop, I can certainly tell you that those two instances I just cited, which are very fresh instances in our mind, would have been completely avoided had those two groups spent time, perhaps on Drupal Gardens, for example, in a walled environment, figuring out how things happen in Drupal and, and not having that option of turning to code. Uh, you know, one of the fun things about being involved with Drupal earlier than I was, from what I can tell, is there was a sense of adventure. And, uh, and I think the early adopters of Drupal were real adventurers. And I think that when you are trying to hire for small shops, you continue to need a certain amount of that adventurousness tempered with, uh, you know, a sense of, um, these paths have been well carved, and it's best probably to pull out the roadmap and figure out, you know, how best to do them. Well, so now here's the problem that goes along with it: uh, the roadmap is not particularly well written out, and there's a ton of stuff you have to know in order to avoid this. So part of what we'd like to talk about today is uh, the plan that we've hammered out and implemented and tested uh, that has been working quite well for getting new people from outside the community up to speed in uh, short order. And we'd also like to talk about uh, uh, some of the challenges around uh, getting the existing uh, developers that you have also uh, to continue with their learning and, and, uh, and growing their skills, especially with a rather dramatic event coming up with, uh, of course, the release of Drupal 8. So I wouldn't claim uh, with Drupal 8 at the point it is in its development right now that we have a good clear idea of exactly what kind of training has to take place. But I think that this format is flexible enough that uh, there will be some applicable items and we'd love to turn this into a conversation, like I said, in pretty short order. So um, we're going to talk a little bit 
uh, like like Kay was saying, talk to you a little bit about how you get um, new people new to Drupal kind of up to speed. Uh, this right here is actually a instructions for climbing the Matterhorn, and it's really not that useful. Um, but we see we see people trying to instruct new Drupal users in a similar way. Um, we we actually talked with several Drupal shops before um, doing this presentation and tried to get a feel of of how um, they brought in new developers. And you know some of them said, well yeah you know we hired a front end person and we expected that they were going to be able to to learn the back end. Uh, but when pressed a little bit, what what they told us was, you know, we essentially, obviously they provided them support, but, you know, we gave them a book and we were kind of hopeful that they were going to, uh, to figure it out. And in reality, um, that's just not, uh, it, you really need to package uh, your training in, in a more structured way. So definitely instructions, support, they're, they're helpful, um, but they will be best uh, when combined with a few other um, more structured items. So things like uh, giving your new trainees uh, simple tasks and tasks that require research and then you know always coming back and reviewing that. And uh, so really if we look at these something like simple tasks um, this can be uh, something as simple as having them run security updates. Uh, you can have them run security updates a few times. Uh, they get into the flow of uh, how they actually have to work with the team. Um, and they kind of start to understand, you know, they may, during security updates, understand uh, what it is, why, um, why you don't hack core, you know? <laughs> you try to... Uh, do a security update and maybe you lose a bunch of important functionality. Um, of course, to go along with that, you know, you can't let your uh, hirees get bored, of course. Uh, so tasks that require research are a great way to make sure that they're learning, that they're involved, that they're interested in the project. Um, I know when I was just starting out, Kay gave me a task to build views with relationships. And uh, at the time that was, uh, it was a bit of a stretch, and uh, but you know it was something that I figured out. I'm sure Kay could have done it much quicker than I could have, uh, but he kind of let me let me work with it and roll with it. And uh, in the end, you know, it's a skill that I've learned and that Kay can now delegate. You know, so uh, it's always coming back to not only your developer becoming uh, a better Drupalist, but you also. Uh, be able, being able to spend your time in a more productive manner. And of course, uh, code review, you, um, if you can't, you know, you need to be able to review what people are um, creating, review uh, the fun functionality that they're making, and really just ensure that they are uh, finding and creating functionality with best, best practices. Um, so with that in mind, we have a, a bit of a sample learning path, and these are things that we think all Drupal, uh, all people new to Drupal need to know. Um, it's not necessarily just somebody uh, that has no technical experience. Uh, somebody who is a PHP developer coming into Drupal will need to know these things too. Uh, if a PHP developer doesn't understand the content system, the navigation system, um, how users work, then you're probably going to end up with someone who really doesn't understand Drupal. So just the configuration and uh, building sites through the admin UI is a really important first step for bringing somebody onto your team. Um, in addition, you know, I know everybody here is uh, uh, interested in being involved in the Drupal community and one of the reasons is that we can rely on each other for um, you know things like bug testing um, and you know just future proofing our site and, and innovating and 
if we don't teach our developers to rely on the community, then we're going to end up with a Drupal site that may or may not be, uh, you know, be upgradable in the future. Uh, I know one of the things that Kay and I talk about a lot and that we've already touched on a couple times is upgrade paths. But, you know, if you're, if you're writing your code in a way that doesn't uh, provide a, a reasonable upgrade path, you're going to be in trouble. Um, and then, of course, the last thing um, being extending Drupal to reuse content, um, just in general, leveraging contributed modules, contributed themes. Um, you know, Kay talked about the Garland theme being hacked uh, earlier. You know, we can, they could have done uh, their, their um, development using a sub theme of Zen, but you know it wasn't something that they understood. So it's not really a knock on them as developers, it's just uh, bringing people into Drupal and showing them what they can do pretty much just through uh, configuration. Um, so we actually have a few sites um, that we know are built through configuration. Uh, this is from the top.org. It is a, uh, a site that was built by own sourcing. Um, and, you know, it's got everything that, that the organization wanted out of a site. And it was built completely through uh, contributed modules. Um, we can see content being reused. We can see users. Um, we have users here being uh, located on the map. And, you know, we have views. This is, a, uh, you know, to us, very simple, but something that you would not want to attempt to write yourself. And, you know, so understanding the, uh, understanding and leveraging what comes from the community is very important. Um, we also, this is a site that was actually built by uh, the, Aquia U program, and I don't remember if Kay actually mentioned it or not, um, but he was the co-director of the Aquia U program, which uh, was a program to train people from outside of Drupal and, and bring them into the Aquia team. And they started on this site when they were one week into their training. Um, they have varying amounts of, of tech technical expertise. Uh, but this site was built with contributed modules, CSS, and a little bit of jQuery. And I think it came out really well, um, you know, for, for any site, not just for a site built by people new to Drupal. So it's really just a, a testament to the things that you can do with Drupal. And yeah, so so these are kind of the a few of the things that I just talked about um, feed into these roles that we normally see in a Drupal team. Um, and basically what I talked about were those first three roles, a site builder, a basic themer, and a site architect. And those are the roles that uh, we believe you can bring in Drupal people, and or sorry, bring in people from outside of the community and really have them contribute right away. Um, Possibly a uh, site architect needs, uh, needs some more experience, but between basic themers and site builders, they'll be contributing to your, your Drupal projects um, within weeks. So there are a couple of other more advanced uh, roles on here as well. And these, I, I don't know how many people are actually familiar with these roles, but they, they've been fairly well uh, tested uh, within the Drupal community. They're a little bit different from the way um, project teams were structured, uh, you know, or probably continue to be structured uh, without Drupal. Uh, but uh, Site Builder, as Jesse was saying, focuses mainly on configuration. A basic themer generally gets the work done using configuration, a little bit of CSS, in some cases HTML, actually, relatively infrequently for really basic theming. And then uh, the site architect helps determine how things are going to be built. Uh, that's quite common across uh, different projects advanced themer and module developer probably self-explanatory uh, enough. Uh, but so how do you deal with the, the more advanced roles in that case? Let's say that these people are already very familiar with the first three items that we've 
identified in our hierarchy of needs. And, uh, and then they are, uh, like actually a lot of projects, looking for the next level of, of skills. Um, I'm imagining that if you have experienced folks on your, on your team, they're already working with uh, uh, what uh, Addy uh, likes to call, uh, Addison Berry likes to call alter coding. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm misattributing that. That's actually uh, Webchick, uh, who was talking about alter coding and uh, how at a certain point you get your site uh, pretty much to where you want it to be and then for the last say 10% you actually need to make alterations to the code uh, and uh, of course Drupal uh, has quite a number of ways of uh, overriding and altering things that doesn't end up changing core code and doesn't ruin your upgrade path. Um, Preprocess -pre functions and alter hooks are certainly two that are worth talking about and then uh, yet another level up if um, you are not finding the types of modules that you need, uh, then obviously uh, somebody who can uh, work with existing APIs uh, to uh, deal with high traffic situations, to deal with integrations, and then some of the larger issues that, uh, for example, the large-scale Drupal working group is working on. You know, these are things that are fairly logical to aspire to if your types of projects uh, lead in that direction and helping to move your more advanced uh, team members in those directions is, is certainly something we'd like to discuss as well. Uh, of course, at a certain point, uh, not all the uh, necessary APIs uh, have, are, have already been written or are underway, and not all of the uh, problems that we, as a Drupal community, will face have been identified. So certainly talking about how one innovates even beyond uh, that is, is worthwhile. Um, whoops. All right. So, uh, when, what does it mean then to set out to actually hire for these roles? If we're going with the assumption that the talent that has, let's say, five, six years of Drupal experience is pretty scarce, pretty hard to find, and we're going with this idea that actually we need to reach outside of our community, in fact, uh, quite energetically, and bring people in, who, who are those people? What should we do? What kinds of projects can we put them on? And how do we help them once we get them in so they're not facing that, that cliff uh, that uh, Jesse was talking about earlier with a couple of sparse instructions about hidden handholds and a, a ledge you can stand on. Um, uh, one of the important things is to recognize that probably uh, some part of all of your projects actually has a good fit for junior developers. And let's just refer to them for now as junior developers, people who are coming in from outside of the, outside of the Drupal uh, community. Uh, so here are some earmarks of, of, characteris of, uh, of projects. Uh, they have a clearly defined engineering task, and what we mean by that is it's, it's appropriate to get them involved once they can basically take... Uh, uh, how many people here actually use JIRA or some similar tasking uh, software? So a good number of them, uh, a good number of people actually um, use uh, JIRA. The, the, the notion is that in, once things get into JIRA, generally the best practice is that they are actionable tasks, that it's no longer uh, at the point of uh, discovering what, uh, you know, what a, for example, a user story is going to be. We have a user story and, and we know uh, that we have some tasks to break out to, uh, to complete those. Um, that's a very different situation from saying, all right, we have this audience and we have, uh, you know, this message and, and how are we going to put those two together. Uh, so clearly defined engineering tasks broken out into actual uh, actionable tasks. Uh, and the opportunity to have the learner participate in the team without actually being part of the velocity to deliver that project. So in other words, they're taking some of the attention away from the people who are giving them assistance, but they're also putting their effort in to relieve some of the tasks. I ideally, those things should balance out. Obviously, at the very beginning, they're probably going to be needing more uh, attention than, than they're giving back, and toward the end, they're going to surpass that. But, but ultimately, you know, on a week-by-week -week basis, you, you should be able to set things up uh, to balance those out. If you've got such an advanced project that that balance isn't conceivable, it's probably not a good fit for someone coming in from the outside, potentially. Um, uh, that, that seems to be a real minority of cases. Um, and then uh, team member, that actually is uh, a bit cryptic. Uh, the opportunity for the learner actually to become a team member is, is another good sign of a project characteristic. Now in some cases, you, uh, you can't actually involve them in these projects for, let's say, a couple of weeks, two, three weeks, 
uh, while they get a, you know used to the team, used to the tools, and used to some of the basic concepts of Drupal. Uh, you know, and it's certainly reasonable to you know look two or three weeks out. Um, you know, to, to figure out what is going to be coming up for these people. So what are some of the characteristics that, that make for good learners? In the, in the survey, and I was actually, uh, as part of the, um, uh, the uh, project, the pilot for Acquia U, I was part of the hiring process as well. And uh, the, the characteristics that we identified ended up being quite true uh, through that project. Uh, the, the first thing that, that seemed, the first distinguisher seems to be, is the candidate actually a good cultural fit? And the culture of your company obviously can be defined in a, in a million different ways. Um, but, you know, uh, making sure that there's an opportunity for, you know, some chemistry, uh, you know, for, for positive experiences in both directions, that seemed to be almost as important as any kind of uh, technical experience they were bringing with them. Uh, Self-directed learners, that the person actually is able to, let's say even demonstrate, that they've, that they've taught themselves a number of things. We're not going to turn them loose entirely on their own, but this ability to identify what they need to learn, what, what they want to learn, and then pursue it, and then you, and find and use the resources that they need. This is probably the thing that most distinguishes this approach to training to the typical thing where you, where you call a training company up and you say, I want two weeks of training from my staff, right? Because at that point, the training company will come to you, or to your office with, uh, you know, a lesson after lesson planned out, uh, you know, and the time filled up with people sitting in a group like this and, you know, listening. Uh, so this is a very, very different approach uh, where you're actually asking people to take responsibility for the things that they are going to learn for the things that you need them to learn and that, that they want to learn. They need to be self-directed learners. And then they also, and this is uh, perhaps uh, the thing that tempers the self-directed learner part, uh, it's good to get indications that they actually know when they've hit a blocker and they can ask for help. Uh, so that they can take, let's say, they can consider a, whether a, prod, a, a problem is challenging or, or rather relatively minor. For a minor one, they spend 15 minutes looking around and tr try to figure out what's going, uh, you know, what's going to uh, be a fruitful path and, uh, and then they go and ask someone for a little bit of a redirect and for a more challenging one maybe they spend half a day but they certainly don't spend say three days on a, prob a problem that they could have gotten good direction on. And then the final item is that they're responsive to coaching. Uh, and I think that when you're interviewing people you can get a pretty good sense of these four items. Uh, they tended to be uh, quite good guides and we can get into in the discussion uh, some of the specific examples that we have. So once you've got a good project at least on the horizon and uh, a good uh, crop of, uh, of hirees, then what do you do with them? Well, obviously they're going to need some of the instruction. Jesse broke out the four learning modes. They're going to need some of the instruction. If they haven't used Git before, you can give them some pretty simple instruction, right? I think we came up with six, six five, Git five commands, six. five or six yeah. Git commands that, that uh, anybody can learn in a very short session and then they can start implementing on these repetitive tasks that, uh, that Jesse was describing. So, you know, they've acquired a little bit of information and they do a whole bunch of things. Those, those specific things may just be fairly rote, but that kind of rhythm of using Git, working with the team, understanding what the tickets are about, responding on tickets, you know, getting them into that flow. Um, give them a bunch of attainable tasks that they can do that on and have a mentor who's actually uh, ready to uh, Pick, one, pick what those tasks are in the project, assign them, uh, serve, you know, to get them unblocked, and review their work as they're going along. So um, uh, identifying people within your team who are able to communicate that way, who are able to identify tasks uh, and, and assign them appropriately, that's, that's not tended to be a big challenge for uh, development teams. They, they generally have people who are able to, to do that, who also have experience with the types of tasks that need to be done. Um, so identifying those mentors and pairing them with learners uh, on the Aqua EU project, we did it relatively uh, arbitrarily. We didn't spend a lot of time thinking about which mentor was going to be paired with which of the eight um, people. It was basically, you know, meet for 15 minutes, walk out with a, with a mentor pairing. And for the most part, they went quite well. There's a lot of uh, will on either side to make the, to make the, the pair, pairing work. So uh, true both for new people coming in from outside of, uh, outside of the community and for people within your team, 
the community itself actually provides a fair number of opportunities for mentorship. Uh, I don't know how many people attended Gabor Hotschi's um, session on contributing to CORE, uh, but he talks a fair amount about good ways of, of uh, uh, learning through uh, getting involved in the issue queue and uh, providing value to uh, someone, a uh, core maintainer in his specific uh, discussion, you know, providing value by being able to get tasks done at the same time you're receiving value because you've got one of the top uh, minds in, in Drupal or, you know, the other people who are assembled around this at least, uh, you know, uh, sharing their thoughts on uh, the best solutions, on, on the code that you've uh, submitted and, and things like that. Obviously, uh, learning opportunities like conferences and meetups are, are really big. I think conferences are probably one of the best ways uh, for sharing information about best practices. Um, so I think that's a great investment, uh, especially in your more senior people, to send them to, uh, to Drupal cons and Drupal camps. Uh, hosting them in your office is a great way of drawing potential talent and you know, giving to the community. So there are quite a number of ways. We also list a, a few URLs, uh, drupalladder.org, great learning resource uh, that Jesse and I have both uh, been involved with, uh, and uh, the core mentoring hours and uh, of course the uh, Drupal 8 community uh, initiatives. So these slides have all been saved, those URLs are, are there on the, um, on the node for the, um, uh, for the session. Uh, so if you don't mind, uh, it'd be great to have your feedback. Uh, we've given a shortened URL here, but it's basically going back to the, uh, to the session node and uh, uh, please uh, go and let us know what you think. But very importantly at this point, uh, like I said, we, we wanted to keep this short so that we could get into more specific uh, stuff. So we got about 20 minutes. And uh, please use the microphone. These are actually being recorded, so it's great to uh, um, share that with uh, remote audiences as well. So I have a question about, you had a slide about making other developers to grow themselves by going to conferences issue queues, contributing, that's, that's great. But how do you motivate them to do that? You cannot force them to do that. So what are your thoughts and experience in this area? So, uh, you know, that's, that's a great uh, question that comes up pretty often. How do you motivate people? One of the things that we didn't talk quite as much about, and I had actually meant to, but we were, I think, uh, pushing a little bit for time, was uh, one of the tools that we use is a learning plan, an individualized learning plan. And usually that's administered by either someone who's very senior in your firm or from, by somebody who's outside your firm. And that learning plan uh, can be as loose as, wow, I'd really like to know more about some, you know, relatively like a, a year out type goal. I'd really like to stretch myself to know more about backbone.js or about you know, any number of exciting things that are happening in the community. If they're, if they're not motivated actually to have those types of goals, um, perhaps you know, setting shorter goals and, and trying to cultivate that motivation uh, would be a good uh, partway step. But just to, uh, let's just assume that uh, whether they're motivated because their performance uh, bonuses are tied to uh, them actually acquiring that information or they're just uh, hungry for knowledge, which uh, tends to be the case a lot, I think, in the, in the Drupal community at large. Um, I think that that starts to provide, uh, I think often motivation is less about um, the impulse or will of the person, and often it's actually more about um, uh, achievability, uh, actually seeing steps for getting to a particular spot and seeing, uh, seeing the, the excitement that happens, whether it's a bonus check or, or actually having skills that, that are exciting to them. You know, laying out these steps, working out what these steps are going to be, how they're going to be enabled, and removing blockers, I think is the main way. I, I, you know, maybe it's my uh, uh, infectious enthusiasm. I've talked to a lot of people who don't feel motivated, and by the end of a conversation, they're generally talking about what's going to be exciting to them. Does that, does that touch on your question, or did you just skirt it? <laughs> yes, but um, my point is more about like okay, we are building a team. Yeah. Yes, and we invite guys from outside of the world. And yes. They do not know about community. They do not know about what means that you contribute back. Right. And you want to put in their minds that it's important. You will grow yourself yeah. and things like that. But you try it. You. 
sometimes look at time for that, but you don't get anything back. So people grow to some degree where they can do their tasks, daily tasks, like they can trick and they can do configurations, they can build some basic modules, and then they suddenly stop. Mm -hmm. They like where they are, and they didn't. They do not go to senior positions. They are not moving ahead. Sure. So and how to work with this? Yeah, and then I that becomes a hurdle for for your company. Um, is uh, is there is there an incentive? Is there enough uh, reason to move out of a place that might be comfortable? Is that part of the problem, or do you think do you think that the problem lies elsewhere? I think it's like I I don't know actually. It's yeah. like two types of people who want to achieve something, so they work hard, and people who are happy with where they are. And actually, making one people to go to another one is extremely hard. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think that that individual coaching, yeah. you know, that that has been the thing that the tool that we pulled out of the toolbox in the past in those situations, and the individual coaching when it's me who's doing it. Basically, the question that I'm I'm asking. I'm asking all kinds of uh, uh, things around interests and activities, waiting to see some kind of spark. So a recent conversation that I had uh, was with someone who was quite excited by, um, by the English language and by writing and uh, by um, uh, finding new ways of communicating with people. And so uh, moving tasks that that person had available in that direction actually ended up being the main motivator and, uh, and led to a uh, a place for uh, room for growth. Uh, so uh, you know, I think I think it's that conversation, finding out why that person is there. If it's true contentment, then it's probably awfully hard to find an incentive not to stay there. <laughs> but if there's something that is you know uh, like a, a you know a better thing that we can reach for, you know, I, I'm not I'm still not sure that I'm I'm satisfying your question, but I'm happy to talk to to you more about it afterward. I mean, it's certainly something that we've come across. Thanks. So. Okay. Yes. Yeah, another question back. Do you mind using the mic just so that people can? Uh... Oh, it's not working. How about we pass? How about if we pass this around then? Oh uh, yeah, that's probably. Hi, is that better? Um, yeah, really enjoyed the um, presentation and already kind of doing a lot of that um, in our recruiting. Um, but on a completely different note, how do you think Drupal 8 and the Symphony stuff? is going to have an impact on everything you've just talked about. <laughs> so uh, it sounds like we've already said a fair amount that was obvious. So uh, unfortunately, with, with that still all unfolding, I think uh, it's a little hard to say anything too concrete. Um, one of the plans that we have is actually around uh, local uh, meetup and uh, actually uh, finding people in the community who are interested in first cracking you know, what, what this can mean for us. Obviously, there are things already available. We can, we can already work with the Symphony framework and Drupal 8. Uh, I haven't confirmed this personally, uh, but I believe that uh, there have been recent releases, and I'm sure there are people in the room who can actually confirm this, recent releases that have components of Symphony already integrated. Is anybody able to confirm that? So if that's the case, and I believe it is, that, uh, then there you can already start. Um, uh, one one uh, good resource for that is actually the Drupal Ladder, drupalladder.org. Uh, you know, install Drupal 8, uh, start looking at the issue queues. It will give a very good sense of where things stand with integration, what challenges are coming up on the one hand. On the other hand, it will uh, help starting you start getting insights into um, what it's really going to mean to adopt um, Symphony. So we'll continue to uh, work on that question, and that's, our, that's the first direction that we plan on taking. Well, first two directions. Um, really enjoyed the, the, the your talk, and um, appreciated a lot of uh, the you know, specifics of, of different approaches you can take to this, you know, bringing in people who are not necessarily Drupal. Um, one thing you didn't mention, though, I mean, you mentioned training, but it kind of indicated, you know, you bring in a trainer and they're going to, you know, sort of do this very um, generic approach. But there is also the other option of there are trainers. I'm one of them. Um, <laughs> Kay and I talked in, in, in Chicago a lot about this. Uh, who will come in and do custom training uh, to projects. Um, so, for example, you know, especially like if you're a small company, 
and your, your existing uh, developers really don't have the time to do this mentorship, but you need to bring on new people, you can find trainers who will, you know, sort of work with you um, uh, to provide that customized training, that kind of mentorship, um, you know, even if you don't personally have, you know, your existing team doesn't have that time. But other than that, I have really excellent ideas. Point taken. Did not sound like it. Boy, <laughs> that speaker must be dangerous. Okay, let's try from over here. Um, I just want to ask, it's really to the floor, if there's so many people here who are recruiting like we are, um, has, have you all given up on local recruiting? Are you looking globally now? Um, and if so, what sort of challenges when talking about mentoring do you get um, when you've got the team that are not in the same place? I suppose it's not really a specific question, it's more of a, uh, is anyone experiencing that? Or well, and I wonder if it's, uh, is that by a raise of hand? I mean, I imagine that a lot of people are feeling frustrated. I wonder if in part, uh, if we can cobble another kind of raise your hand type question, does anybody suspect that um, the requirements perhaps in the, in the ads that are going out to the local area uh, seem like a barrier? I mean, we keep seeing these, the, the inspiration it was Jesse saying, look at these, look at this long list of ads and people are looking for the entire lamp stack. You know, we want you to have it all. And C sharp. And, you know. So, you know, it's like, shoot, what do you do at that point? So if, if several people said, yeah, they think that that's part of it. Uh, So the response, for those who couldn't hear it, if I can paraphrase, the response was uh, like IBM, uh, the IBM hires saying, we don't care what you know, we'll teach you what you need to know. Yeah, the motivation to grow as opposed to the money is, is really where the solution lies, hiring the people who are motivated to grow. You're looking for people who are motivated by the... Oh, thank you. you, you <laughs> this feeds back into your first slide, uh, which you just touched on and then moved on with actual sort of uh, training and, and so on. But it, you're looking for people who are motivated by the top of the pyramid, not the middle or the bottom. Sure. It doesn't really matter what their skills are. What you're looking for are the people who are motivated by self-actualization. Thanks for bringing that back around. <laughs> yeah, and to to help the lady a little bit, uh, I will say that the training of new people coming to your company uh, should be a process on the long term, and uh, uh, to solve the time problem for the older people through the company that might become mentors and help others. Uh, becomes also a project management related issue. So you should include this time in their time and give them uh, a free window every day so they can have time to take care of for those new people. Uh, so it becomes part of the project schedule, the project budget and everything else. So they create this free time for them to help others and train others. Uh, yeah, that's any a, that's any, a any new recruit in a company, it's new. Uh, it's it's new there. He has 
he needs time to adapt, he, he needs time to learn new things. Uh, so, because he needs that time, we have to give, uh, to take that time from others' time and give it to him, to help him. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a point worth emphasizing. It was really gratifying when um, working with the Acquia team that basically everybody in the Acquia office recognized that um, uh, helping the new folks get up to speed was going to solve problems for them down the road. And, uh, you know, I think the, the, um, the culture was uh, ready, uh, you know, and, and was geared in that direction. And people, uh, the project management load that you're talking about, there, there were a couple of points. Uh, perhaps you know we should break those out uh, after, so that people uh, who want to go off to beer can can do that. But um, there were a couple of key points where the project management load was particularly heavy to prepare for uh, integrating people into the team and in, and giving them real uh, real life tasks. And then after that beginning point, then the the project management side of things was a bit more distributed. Uh, mostly by relying on mentors and uh, and by relying on people who uh, ha who owned uh, a set of tasks and could involve uh, the person uh, who was learning in that set of tasks. So they still needed a little extra time. A lot of that was balanced out by being able to hand things off. Drupal is famous for being uh, self-organizing, so it's cool. The mic gets passed. So you may have already answered this question. I was wondering if you could recommend any resources for finding part-time or contract-based Drupal help. Something, something like something like Elance or uh, something similar to that. Odesk. I personally don't have a specific recommendation. We've been focusing on uh, getting talent and growing it, so we haven't been quite as focused on, I mean, the, the Drupal meetups, uh, certainly, without a question, are great for building that kind of Rolodex. And I don't know if you're talking about a larger scale than that. Uh, and then just working on projects, collaborating with other companies has led to us having uh, resources beyond you know, just the ones that we're growing. I don't know if that helps at all, but it's really been, for us, it's been Rolodex driven. Does anybody else have a, like a resource that they use? Um, uh, one thing I would say with that is some of the, the sort of same sort of uh, resources you would use outside of Drupal for um, uh, looking for that kind of um, help, like you know Craigslist and the various uh, I can't remember any of the names of them right now, but the various you know job posting sites that are generalized. Um, but one of the things you want to do there, going back to the point we just had a little bit ago, is you want to make sure that your advertisements are asking for what you actually need um, in, a, in a Drupal. One of the problems that we have is uh, particularly companies who don't know anything about Drupal but want to hire Drupalers, um, they're asking for the wrong things. Um, what they need is a site builder, someone who can click through and build a site, but they're asking for a module developer by saying, I would, you know, we need a Drupal developer who has ma amazing PHP skills. Um, and you know, that just frustrates everybody. So one of the things that's important you know, if you're looking for, you know, either, you know, if you're looking for experienced Drupalers, is, you know, ask for what you actually need in the terms that are familiar to, to Drupal people so that they'll recognize, oh, they're not really asking for a module developer. They just, you know, they need a site builder or, you know, they need a themer um, because that will really help you connect to the people you actually, you know, you're trying to hire. Yeah, that's a good point. I think we have the room for about uh, three more minutes, so there's probably two questions worth. <laughs> 